Hello mortals. What if I told you that in the close future, we could upgrade the human model to version 2? That could include fixing the issue of tongue biting while eating, patching the memory leak of type entered the room and forgot why, and finally solving the issue of having the motivation module constantly failing to load. This might sound like the update change list of some underpaid Polish game developer, but in reality, it is a sneak peek behind the curtains of the future of genetic engineering. Moore's law is the historical observation that the number of transistors in a circuit doubles about every two years and is telling of the accelerated progress of technology. But when it comes to the cost of gene sequencing, the Moore's law appears to be pretty off. In 2001, in order to determine the order of the nucleotides in your DNA, you'd have to pay around $100 million. Today, you can get your DNA sequenced for a price 100,000 times cheaper than that, at barely $1,000. So what was the reason for the price crashing almost as hard as a rather mimi cryptocurrency on a bad day? It's the breakthroughs in genetic engineering in the past decade, with gene sequencing platforms such as Solexa and Illumina, and the ever-increasing demand for such processes. But perhaps the most significant discovery of the past decades in the domain of genetic engineering is, and you might have already heard of it, CRISPR, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, having a Nobel Prize awarded for its discovery in 2020. Let's go over how it functions in rather simple terms. Bacteria are under the constant threat of extermination by bacteriophages. They attack by inserting their genetic material inside the bacteria and thus taking over it. Sometimes, the bacteria resist the attack and store the bacteriophage DNA for later use as protection against other attacks. If a subsequent one happens, the bacteria recognize the intruder and generate an RNA copy from the bacteriophage's DNA. The RNA is fed to a special protein, called Cas9. This protein then embarks on an adventure to find the bacteriophage DNA. Then, the perfect RNA match is found, and the protein cuts out the intruder's DNA, rendering the attack obsolete. Upon observing this, genetic engineers realized that they can use this mechanism in order to very precisely manipulate genetic material. Theoretically, one could identify a problematic genetic sequence, create a matching guide RNA, and attach it to a Cas9 protein which would then make a surgical cut in the DNA sequence. After this, the gene engineers could make modifications to the existing genome, thus making the CRISPR technology something akin to a genetic cut and paste tool. You can probably imagine how insane the potential of this can be, from curing all genetic diseases, to designing the perfect human, and perhaps immortality. And of course, this all comes with a plethora of moral questions. But crispr ka is already being used to make life better for all, by engineering better crops to meet the growing needs of a world challenged by many environmental and humanitarian problems. Simply, to grow more and better food even when the climate is in crisis and populations are under more pressure than ever before. That's why, we actually got Francesca, a PhD student on board that is an author of a published work regarding the use of crispr ka systems in plants and crop improvement. Hey guys! Hey Francesca, can you give us an overview of the results of crispr cas research so far? So not long after CRISPR-Cas9 was discovered, plant scientists adapted it to work in Arabidopsis, which is a classical uh, model organism used in plant science. Overall, CRISPR allows you to change the DNA sequence very precisely. For example, you can target the start and the end of a gene, and that will cause it to be missing in the following generation. This allows you to deduce the function of the protein associated with that gene by studying the phenotype of the plant. So in the study, we use CRISPR in Arabidopsis to target the gene that codes for ribosomal RNA. These are essential components of the ribosomes. And because cells need to make plenty of ribosomes, there can be thousands of copies of this gene. And they're usually repeated one after the other in very large clusters. With a single guide targeting one ribosomal RNA gene, we hypothesized that we could target all the repeats. And this we thought would create a lot of repeated DNA breaks with the result of losing actual DNA and losing copies of ribosomal RNA genes. So this is exactly what happened. We obtained plants that have around 300 copies instead of 3000. And funnily enough, we found that ribosomal RNA is not affected at all. 
We additionally found plants that suffer from something called genomic instability. This means that the upkeep and the maintenance of chromosomes is not functioning as it should, and it could have some serious adverse reactions in the plant cell cycle, and we're still working on this aspect. My hope is that more scientists will become interested in this project and that they will apply it to crops to study how genome instability in plants can be overcome. As this is something, it can be triggered by heat and other stresses, such as drought. And we don't really know what effects can have on plant development. That's great. What are the challenges you see about engineering these crops of the future? For me, the most exciting aspect of CRISPR is the ability to improve crops in a very short amount of time compared to traditional breeding, which is a process that usually lasts a few decades. And as many other plant scientists, I was very disappointed when the EU voted to restrict the use of CRISPR edited organisms, putting them under a virtual ban. I really do understand the concerns of the general public regarding DNA mutagenesis, like most scientists do. But there is also a lot of misinformation in general, and obviously COVID is a good example of this. Personally, I feel the decision of the EU was a step in the wrong direction because we need to think about how our crops are going to survive the climate crisis. The majority of fruits and grains we heavily rely on for daily nutrition are not very resistant to stress and pathogens. With CRISPR, you can shorten breeding times by decades and obtain a more resistant crop to any of these threats in the space of a couple of years. I heard there might be a new vote and I hope the restrictions are going to be lifted. Could you also give us a brief overview of the process of your research? I graduated in biotechnology at the National University of Ireland, Galway, also known as NUIG. And then I did a master's in evolutionary biology in Milan, Italy. And there I researched uh, reproduction in Arabidopsis uh, for my master's thesis. And I really, really loved it. I returned to Galway for my PhD with Professor Charles Spillan, and I started working on this project using CRISPR. Together with my colleague Antoine Four, we carried out mutagenesis and the selection for, of the plants. But we reached a point when we needed more expertise to verify that our findings were solid. To do this, I joined Cost Action in depth. In depth stands for impact of nuclear domains on gene expression and plant traits. This network is supported by Cost which stands for cooperation in science and technology. And these are European actions or associations that finance networking and scientific exchange activities. In depth involved more than 80 research groups from 32 European countries, and it represented a huge opportunity for me to exchange knowledge and network with other researchers and other PhD students. I took part to one of in depth technical school to learn a new technique in microscopy with a group of other 15 PhD students and postdocs. This was organized over a week at the Université clermont auvergne and here I first met Aline Probst and we started a collaboration with her group. Around the same time, at an annual in-depth meeting, I met with Frédéric Ponvian from the Université de Perpignan, who invited me uh, to his lab to learn and carry out different molecular biology techniques in his laboratory. We published all the results so far as a breakthrough report in a journal called The Plant Cell. And for me, the most exciting part is I still have many biology related questions that hopefully I will get to answer throughout the course of my scientific career. Is the technology useful to anyone else? Cancer biologists, for instance? That's a great question because genome instability is a hallmark of cancer in mammalian cells and many types of cancer feature loss of ribosomal RNA genes. However, this is the first time this kind of mutagenesis has ever been done on plants. And one of the most exciting things for me would be to see this research applied to crops, as we are going to face some uncertain times and we will need our crops to be very resistant to the effects of heat and drought. Plant science is really relevant and exciting, and there are so many opportunities for young scientists to do really meaningful and important research. In many ways, what I do in the lab is similar to what our colleagues in biomedical research do, only I use plants instead of cells. And if you had to guess, what would be the biggest impact of CRISPR during our lifetime? 
it might sound weird, but for me, it would be to see more acceptance from the public around this technology. And I am talking specifically about enhancing our food production with CRISPR. The countries which are going to be the most affected by the climate crisis are the ones that are already struggling to sustain their population. And CRISPR could mean the difference between fields devastated by pathogens and crops that are resistant to that pathogen. So I personally think it could be life-changing for millions of people. CRISPR in humans has already been done. And while we don't know what is happening with the twins that were genetically modified a few years ago, I personally find there are too many ethical implications in trying to genetically modify humans, even for really good intentions like curing diseases or reversing old age. It might happen, but I think it will definitely be past my lifetime. Thanks for taking your time to tune in, Francesca. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure answering your questions. And thanks to our sponsors Cost and Asta Sciences, which gave us the opportunity to meet Playaza and in depth. The most immediate and impactful use of CRISPR, as previously mentioned, will be enhancing crop efficiency in the agricultural industry for feeding the estimated 10 billion people alive by 2050. Currently, there are two issues to take care of the land area used for crops is not infinite and the weather extremes caused by climate change will only get more intense with time, meaning more destroyed crops. Luckily, CRISPR seems to provide a solution for both of these problems. By targeting specific genes, we could improve the yield and the stress tolerance of crops. An increased yield would help meeting the needs of a growing population and a limited land, while increasing their resistance to environmental stressors alleviate the effects climate change has on agriculture. Droughts, early frosts, Insects and diseases can be combated by engineering crops with the required defensive traits. So far so good. We have the problem and the solution to the problem. But humans wouldn't be humans if they didn't complicate things for themselves. Regulators from the European Union took a tough stance on controlling GMOs, the definition of which includes CRISPR. The very strict evaluation techniques imposed significantly slow down the potential advancements made available by CRISPR. Although, by definition, it would seem that using CRISPR should be considered creating genetically modified organisms, scientists argue that they shouldn't be put in the same basket, as CRISPR adds no foreign DNA to an organism, unlike GMOs do. But regulators don't seem to listen to the scientists as they are influenced by the economically and politically driven lobbyists. That's why we have a mission of spreading the scientific truth and hopefully soon influence the vote on the stance of CRISPR that will play an important role in our war against climate change. Following this, let's look at the next life-changing use of CRISPR in the close future, the elimination of diseases including genetic ones. Cancer, HIV, Alzheimer, and countless other horrible illnesses could be defeated once and for all. A win against them would mean the next step for humanity, fixing the accidents of their own genetic mechanism. Once the treatment is available, it will see fast worldwide adoption without much consideration of ethics, since the elimination of suffering is one of humanity's top moral priorities, even if humans aren't always good at striving for it. The morality of the situation gets fuzzier once we cross the border of treating diseases into the land of genetic improvements. It's not a very far jump from editing out malicious DNA to editing an embryo's site acuity or height to the desired values. But why stop at small improvements? Any physical characteristic can be edited in one's DNA. Do you want your child to be highly intelligent with a faultless memory, great physical shape and perfect immune system? Of course, after all, it would be immoral to not give the best possible life you can to your child and leave him with a preventable disadvantage to all their peers. Talk about them being mad at you in their teenage years. But the issue arises when it comes to one thing. Money! <laughs> when this technology comes, it will not be the cheapest of things. And until it drops in price, the richest that can afford it will be the first to want to jump on board, making the class inequality gap significantly more pronounced. And what about the very poor? They might never have enough money to afford genetically modifying their offspring. This not only would have an impact on individuals, but forever change entire countries. The rich ones would grow superhuman mutants leaving the poorer countries quite a bit behind. One solution would be to wait until the prices drop so much that everyone on earth can afford it, 
but we already know that humans aren't perfectly moral creatures, why would one want to give up their advantage over the others? And we're not even speaking about leaders willing to get an edge over their rivals by upgrading their population first. All in all, acquiring control over the code of life is perhaps the defining step for any intelligent civilization, which could also act as a test of wisdom and maturity. Once this happens, would humans still be considered Homo sapiens, or should they be renamed to Homo Deus? A very bright future awaits, but we should be careful not to let our intelligence run too far ahead of our wisdom.